live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering AWS reInvent 2018. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services, Intel, and their ecosystem partners. Hey, welcome back everyone. Live here in Las Vegas for AWS Amazon Web Services, reInvent 2018's CUBE coverage. Two sets, wall-to-wall -wall coverage here on the ground floor. I'm here with Dave Vellante. Dave, six years we've been coming to reInvent. Every year except for the first year. What a progression, great news. Always raising the bar, as they say at Amazon. This year, big announcements. One of them is blockchain. Really kind of laying out early formation of how they're going to roll out and think about blockchain. We're here to talk about here with Raul Pathak, who's the GRM of analytics and data lakes and blockchain, managing that. And Sean Bice, who's the vice president of non-relational databases. Guys, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Thank you, it's great to be here. I wish my voice was a little bit stronger. I love this segment. You know, we've been doing blockchain. We've been following, we're going to a lot of the big events in the industry. If you separate out the whole token ICO scam situation, token economics is actually a great business model opportunity. Um, blockchain is an infrastructure, decentralized infrastructure. That's great, but it's early. Day one, really, for you guys, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a literal sense. How are you guys doing blockchain? Take a minute to explain the announcement, because there are use cases, low-hanging use cases, that look a lot like IoT and supply chain that are, people are interested in. Yeah. So take a minute to explain the announcements and what it means. Absolutely, so when we began looking at blockchain and blockchain use cases, uh, we really realized there are two things that customers are trying to do. One case is uh, really take an immutable record of transactions and, where, and they're in a scenario where centralized trust is, is okay. And for that we have Amazon QLDB, which is an immutable, cryptographically verifiable ledger. And then in scenarios where customers really wanted the decentralized trust and the smart contracts, uh, that's where blockchain frameworks like Hyperledger Fabric and Ethereum play a role. Uh, but they're just super complicated to use, and that's why we built Amazon blockchain, managed blockchain uh, to make it easy to stand up, scale, and monitor these networks so customers can focus on building applications. And in terms of use cases on the decentralized side, uh, it's, it's really quite diverse. I mean, we've got a customer, uh, Guardian Life Insurance, so they're looking at managed blockchain because they have this distributed network of partners, providers, patients, and customers, and they want to provide decentralized, verifiable records of what's taken place. Um, and um, it, you know, it's just a broad set of use cases. Number one, we saw in the video this morning, I think it was Indi Indonesian farmers, right? Wasn't that before the keynote? Did you see that? It was oh, I good. I missed that. Yeah, so they, they don't have bank accounts. Oh, got it. And they got a reward system, so they're using the blockchain to reward farmers to participate. So a lot of people ask the question is, why do I need blockchain? Why don't I just put it in a database? So there are unique, which is true by the way, because you don't need the latency's an issue, you know, certainly might want to avoid blockchain in the short term mm -hmm. until that gets fixed. Assume that it will get fixed over time. Um, but what are some of the use cases where blockchain actually is relevant? Can you be specific? Because that's really people starting to make their selection criteria on, look, I still use a database. I'm going to have all kinds of token and models around. <laughs> you put it in a database. Yeah. Where is the blockchain specifically resonating right now? You know, I, I think we can take, uh, I'll take a shot at this, we can do it together, but when you think of QLDB, um, it's not that customers were asking us for a ledger database. What they were really saying is, hey, you know, we'd like to have this complete, immutable, ver cryptographically verifiable trail of data. Um, and, and it wasn't necessarily a blockchain conversation, wasn't necessarily a database conversation, it was like, I really would like to have this complete cryptographic verifiable trail of data. Um, and it turns out, you know, as, as you sort of look at the use cases, in particular the centralized trust scenario, uh, QLDB does exactly that. It, it's, it's not about decentralized trust, it's really about simply being able to have a database that when you write to that database, you write a transaction to the database, you can't change it. And once, and, and that's, you know, typical database people are like, well, hey, wait a second, what does immutable really mean? Uh, and, and once you get people to understand that once that transaction is written to a journal, it cannot be changed, in a, uh, changed at all and attached, then all of a sudden there's that breakthrough moment of it being immutable and having that cryptographic trail. And the advantage relative to a distributed blockchain is performance scale and all the yeah. other challenges that people always yeah, say. Often, yeah, exactly. Like with QLDB you can find, uh, you know, it's going to be two to three times faster because you're not doing that distributed consensus. 
How about data lakes? <clears throat> Let's talk about data lakes. What sure. problem were you guys trying to solve with the data lakes? There's a lot of them, but. <laughs> yes, no, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, essentially it's been hard for customers to set up data lakes because you have to figure out where to get data from, you have to land it in S3, you've got to secure it, you've then got to secure every analytic service that you've got, you might have to clean your data. Um, and so with lake formation, what we're trying to do is make it super easy to set up data lakes so we have blueprints for common databases and data sources. Uh, we bring that data into an S3 data lake and we've created a central catalog for that data where customers can define granular access policies at the table and the column and the row level. Uh, we've also got ML-based data cleansing and data dupli deduplication. And so now customers can just use lake formation, set up data lakes, curate their data, protect it in a single place, and have those policies then enforced across all of the analytic services that they might use. So, so does it help solve the, you know, the data swamp problem, get more value out of the, the data lake, and if so, how? Uh, absolutely, so the way it does that is by automatically cataloging all data as it comes in, mm -hmm. so we can recognize what the data is, and then we allow customers to add business metadata to that, so they can tag this as customer data, or PII data, or this is my table of uh, sales history, and that then becomes searchable. So we automatically generate a catalog as data comes in, and that addresses the, what do I have in my data lake problem. Okay, so, go ahead. So, Ro, you're the general manager. Sean, what's your job, what do you do? So I, I, our team builds uh, all the non-relational databases uh, at Amazon. So DynamoDB, Neptune, Elasticache, uh, TimeStream, which you, you hear about today, QLDB, et cetera. So all those things. Beanstalk are too? Elastic no. Beanstalk? No, we're not, we do not build Beanstalk. Okay. <clears throat> we're a customer of DynamoDB, by the way. Great. A happy customer. That's great. And we use Elasticash, right? Yep. There you, you know, go. Elastic Surge, Elastic. Elastic. So we use Neptune yet, but. What's the biggest challenge, problem statements that you guys are trying to raise the bar on? What's the key focus? As you got these new worlds and use cases coming together, these are new use cases. What do you, how are you guys evaluating it? How are you guys raising the bar? You know, um, it's, that's a really good question you asked. I, you know, what I found in my experience is developers that have been building apps for a long time, most people are familiar with relational databases. For years we've been building apps in that context. But you know, when you kind of look at how people are building apps today, it's very different than how they did in the past. Today developers do what they do best. They take an application, a big application, break it down into smaller parts, and they pick the right tool for the right job. I think the game developer market is going to be a canary in the coal mine for developers because the, the, and it's a good spot for data formation in these kind of unstructured, non-relational scenarios. Okay, I got all this engagement data, it could be first person shooter or whatever it is. Just throw it in, I need to throw it somewhere and yeah. I'll get to it and, and let it be ready to be worked on by analytics. Well, yeah, I mean, if you think about that gamer scenario, think about like if you and I are building a game, who knows if there's going to be one user, 10 players or 10 million or 100 million. And if we had 100 million, it's all about the performance being steady. Yeah. At 100 million or 10. You so need a fleet of servers. And a fleet of servers. <laughs> well, have, you, have you guys played Fortnite or do you have kids that play? I, I look over yeah. my kid's shoulder. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Epic I've Games played, run all their I, analytics yeah. on us. They got about 14 petabytes in S3 using S3 as our data lake with EMR and Athena for analytics. So. We got a season six. I mean, think about the F1, F1, uh, F1 example on Keynote th uh, today. Great example of insights. If you apply that kind of concept to Fortnite, uh, by the way, Fortnite has a, uh, the cube in there. It's always a popular yeah. term. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we noticed that the hashtag, where's the cube today? Um, <laughs> good, <laughs> good resist. But the analytics they could get out of all that data, um, every interaction, all that That's gesture right. data, I mean, what are some of the things they're doing? Can you share how they're using the new tech to scale up and get these insights? Yeah, absolutely. So they're doing a bunch of things. I mean, one is just the health of the system. So when you've got hundreds of millions of players, you need to know if you're up and it's working. The second is around engagement, what games, what collection of people work well together. And then it's what incentives they create in the game, what power-ups people buy that lead to continued engagement, because that defines uh, success over the long term, what gets people coming back. Yeah. And then they have an offline analytics process where they're looking at reporting and history and telemetry. So it's very comprehensive. So you're exactly right about gaming and analytics being a huge consumer of yeah. databases. Now, Sean, didn't you guys have hard news today on, on DynamoDB? Or? Yeah, today we announced uh, DynamoDB On Demand. So, uh, so customers that basically have workloads that are uh, could spike up and then all of a sudden drop off. A lot of these customers basically don't even want to think about capacity planning. They don't want to guess. 
They just want to basically pay only for what they're using. So we announced DynamoDB on demand, and the developer experience is simple. You create a table, and you want your read, you put your read write capacity in the on demand mode, and you literally only pay for the requests uh, that your workload puts yeah. through the system. It's a great service, actually. <clears throat> Again, making life easier for customers. <laughs> you know, lower the bill, manage capacity. Make things go better, faster, enable it's some all value. It's improving the customer experience. All right, guys, really appreciate you coming in. I'm really interested in following what you guys do in the future. I'm sure a lot of people watching will be as well as analytics and AI become real part of as you guys move the stack and create that API model for what you did for infrastructure, for apps, a total game changer, we believe. Uh, we're interested in following you guys. I'm sure others are. Where are you going to be this year? What's your focus? Where can people find out more besides going to the Amazon site? Is there certain events you're going to be at? What's the, how do people get more information and what's the plans? Yeah, so there'll be, um, there's actually some sessions on lake formation and blockchain that, are, that we're doing here. Uh, we'll have a continuous stream of summits, so as the AWS Summit calendar for 2019 gets published, that's a great place to go for more information. And then just uh, engage with us either on social media or through the web and we'll be happy great. to follow up. All right, well we'll do a good job of amplifying. A lot of people are interested, certainly blockchain, super hot, but people want better, stronger, more stable, Absolutely. but they want the decentralized, immutable, database model. Cryptographically Cryptographic. verifiable. Yeah. And so, as everyone knows, <laughs> scalable. The, anyone who watches the Cube knows I talk about KubeCoin, but I, I, haven't said, I haven't said KubeCoin once on this episode. Yeah. Wait for those tokens to be released soon. <laughs> More coverage after this short break. Stay with us. That's I'm great. John Furrier and Dave Vellante. We'll be right back.